Hi everyone, it's Milton again. So uh, I guess um, this desert sun actually uh, overheated my phone and it turned it off. So I apologize for the inconvenience. I'm not sure where I left off. Um, I should have actually checked it before I, I started this live stream again, but um, you know, <laughs> I was a little nervous of trying to get this thing done here. Um, so I, I wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be too choppy. But um, so just as a, as a, as a recap, uh, so there was a dream I had, you know, over 20 years ago, Native Americans, you know, uh, I'm seeing from a perspective of an eagle and I'm seeing this tribe with a chief and two sons, an elder and a younger. And the elder, and, and then the chief dies. And so the question was, who's gonna be taking over the tribe as a new leader? And so uh, the elder was stronger and had more experience as being a warrior. And uh, so he oftentimes would beat up the younger brother and uh, who was more of a um, domestic, let's say. And so um, until one day that the younger brother got tired of getting beat up. And so he ended up going into um, the, the teepee, which, you know, I think equates to a, uh, to, um, a, um, a prayer closet. And so um, the moral of the story is, oh yeah, when he came out, he, he came out stronger, taller, and completely ripped, you know, muscle-bound muscle man. And so he was able to overpower his older brother and he became the new chief of the tribe. And so I was correlating that with the scripture in uh, Genesis 25, 20 through, 22 through 24, where it talks about that um, it's um, the prophecy uh, to Rebecca about her sons, Jacob and Esau. And the Lord tells her that there will be two nations inside of her womb and one will be stronger than the other. And, um, and so, and the elder shall serve the younger. And so I'm correlating the elder as our flesh because that's the one that came first. You know, we were born in this flesh first before we were ever born of the spirit. And so um, the beautiful part is that we have through the spirit, when we're born again, when we repented of our sins, been baptized in the name of Jesus, uh, we have been born again and now we don't operate under the power of our flesh, not by our own ability, not by our own power, not by our own sheer will, but it's by the power of the Spirit. And so we are empowered in our inner man. The things that are stronger than we are in our flesh, the things that are mightier than us, uh, are not stronger than God. God is the source of our strength. When we're born again and we yield our vessels to Him, when we yield our lives to Him and leave the decision-making to Him, He fights our battles and He gives us the strength. Psalms 144, I believe it says, I praise the Lord who is my strength for He teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Not just in the natural, the, the, he gives me cunning and he gives me strategy and he gives me the ability to overpower my enemies. And those enemies now in, 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 uh, in, this, uh, in this life, in the New Testament, are not physical enemies, but they're the enemies of the spirit. The demons, dominions, powers, principalities, authorities, in dark, rulers in dark places. And so I, I started the second video here just as a recap. Uh, inside the car, I'm cooling down my phone. And, um, and so <laughs> I apologize that that, uh, that other thing just kind of cut off there for all those who are just tuning in now. Uh, maybe I'll start doing it this way now from now on. Uh, hopefully it, uh, there's not too much glare in the back, um, but uh, it, it might make it a little bit better and easier to, uh, to continue doing the, the videos and stuff like that. Um, although I do like the different sceneries, because uh, I'm, I'm somewhat of an outdoors person, but um, you know, it's just I love being in the outdoors. I just don't like what it takes to get there sometimes. But that's just my humanity. So I digress. Going back to the story here, to the to the dream, and uh, so when the younger son 
came out of the teepee, came out of the prayer closet. He came out stronger, mightier than his older brother who had browbeaten him pretty much all his life. And this is part of the dream. And so he ended up taking over the tribe. So the moral of the story is that we are stronger because God is greater in us than he that is in the world. It doesn't matter how many things are against us. It doesn't matter what circumstances, situations are arrayed as an army against us. Because in Romans 8, 37, I believe it says that, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Interesting observation on that one is in, in the Amplified Version, I believe, it says that if God is for us, who can be against us and succeed? That's a powerful statement because it's a, almost like a play on words. Obviously, you understand the, the principle of, you know, whoever comes against you will not succeed against you. Because that's what the, the Bible says. It says, you know, if God be for us, then who can come against us and war against us or contend against us and succeed? basically succeed their attack but it also actually to me at least it gives an implication that other people's successes in their life is contingent on how they come against us if they come against us if we have done nothing wrong to anybody uh, then we have nothing to fear and God will defend us and so they won't be able to succeed in their enterprise. They won't be able to succeed in their endeavors because they have come against the child of God. You, child of God, are the most powerful entity here on earth. Not because of who you are, not because of your person, but because who lives inside of you. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And everything that is around you is in subjection unto you. When you are in subjection unto God, you become aligned with him and his purpose. And when you have his purpose in mind and you and he are aligned, there is no stopping the power of God working inside of you. The greatest power there is, is the power of faith and love. Because our faith is empowered by love. The Bible talks about it, I forget exactly in the New Testament, I'll find it. But it says that faith which worketh by love. And God is love. So when we are operating from a motivating factor of love, when we're doing what we're doing, when we're sharing our testimony, when we're helping somebody else, when we're saying a kind word, when we're saying, speaking a word of faith, a word of wisdom, doing a video, for goodness sake, making a post, and, and our motivation is that of love, to encourage, to edify, to to build up the body of Christ, God's love is operating through us, and we, it operates our faith. Which leads me into the next segment of this. I didn't pre, uh, <laughs> pre, premeditate this, so please bear with me as I just kind of go with the flow. Different thoughts have been coming to me, you know, for a while now, and uh, you know, I was, you know, I, I oftentimes struggle with uh, trying to stay in track of what it is that I'm saying, but you know, I'm just gonna go with the flow. So. There's a scripture in the Bible, which, which I'll post it on there, uh, on, on the comments here, that it, it says, there are diversities, diverse types of miracles. Now, we're talking about the gifts of the Spirit, right? And so, the gifts of the Spirit are empowered by the fruit of the Spirit. One of the fruit of the Spirit is faith, and one of the gifts of the Spirit is faith. One of the fruit of the Spirit is love, and that empowers our faith and our ability to move. Now, in, uh, in, I believe it's Acts 1.8, it talks about, it says, For when you, uh, when you are endued, in endued with power from on high, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you will be endued with power from on high. That power there, the word power, is dunamis power. Uh, is in the Greek, means dunamis, or where we get the word dynamite. That word dynamite is not just an explosive power, but it's actually, it, it means miracle working power. Miracle working power power and that goes on to all of the believers as soon as you get the gift of the holy ghost and you start speaking in other tongues you have god's power to work miracles now i use that to go into the other scripture where i said there are diverse types of miracles now that means 
Why are there diverse types of miracles? Why are there different types of miracles? The reason why is because there are different types of impossibilities. Your impossibility, your situation, your impossible situation may be completely different than mine and vice versa. And so we need that power, that wonder working, miracle working power to dwell inside of us. And that is done through faith, but is empowered by God's love, God's agape love. God's all loving, his, his great love that he shares inside of us. When we pray, the Bible says, when we pray, and I think it's in Romans 5, when we pray in the Holy Ghost, when we start speaking in other tongues, the Bible says that God's love fills our hearts. And that right there, good morning, Sister Shalom. Uh, and so that right there is what fills our heart. When we are full of love, we have access to everything that's in God's kingdom. Through faith, we access all things and all things are, are possible to us because nothing can stand in the face of faith. Fear is the only thing that can paralyze our faith. Faith can work wonders, can move mountains, can, you can see the dead raised by your faith. You can do, you know, many wonderful works through faith. But the only thing that stops faith in its tracks is fear. But God has a solution for that. He says, but perfect love casteth out fear. So what that means is it forcibly, it grabs it like a wrestler and it forcibly removes it from your presence. Now, if you have... The thing that would inhibit your faith, the only thing that would stand against your faith and paralyze your faith in its tracks, if that's removed out of the way, then everything is possible to you if you believe. Not because you have a, the um, faith in your ability to believe, but it's faith in the one who performs the promises. If he promised it, the onus is on him to perform that promise. And so we rely on his working power. We rely on his faith and his love that is working inside of us to believe God for the miraculous, to believe God for the impossible, and not just for us, but also for those who we minister to, because there are people who are connected to you that only you can touch, people that are you saw, have seen you grow up, people that you know have known a year, 10 years, five years, and you are able to minister to them. God wants to minister to those people through you, through me. We just have to let him. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. There is a let. And that is our choosing. God's ability, God's power is unlimited and he's always ready to work. He's always ready to do. Oftentimes we limit God by not letting him do it through us. God, I've heard loves your enemies as much as he loves you. Let that sink in there for a bit. That person that is against you, that person that you are against, the person that you have ought against, that person that it has offended you, that person that you just can't stand for whatever reason. Maybe they said something, maybe they did something, maybe you took something wrong, maybe they purposefully did it. But you're holding in a grudge against that person deep down inside you may not say it but God knows our hearts he weighs our spirits and he knows what is happening inside of here inside of here and he wants to address that so he wants us to get that removed and that comes through being honest when we can go honest before God and say God I have this problem against this person whether I feel justified in having this issue with this person or I don't maybe I'm you know blowing it out of proportion maybe I got offended and now you know I have this you know holding this person at bay and that right there is a problem because God will not accept our offering of praise according to Matthew he said leave your gift at the altar and go be reconciled with your brother first. But before that, he says, if you have ought against your brother. It doesn't say if your brother or your sister have an issue with you. It says if you have an issue with your brother and sister, you go 
and make it right with them. It doesn't say wait for them. It doesn't say sit there, wait for them to come and make it right with you and come up to apologize. Those who are the peacemakers, the Bible says, are called the children of the Most High. We are called to be peacemakers. We are called to extend that olive branch and to say, hey, confessing your faults one to another, confessing that actually in, in the Amplified, it, it says one of them, it, uh, it explains it as confessing your offense or what you've been offended by. So the Bible talks about it very clearly. If somebody offends you, you are to rebuke that person and said, hey, look, you did this, that, and the other, or you said this thing, and that offended me. If that person repents, then you are to forgive. That's, this is biblical stuff. So if somebody offends you, you rebuke that person, and you said, hey, you offended me by doing this, that, and the other, or saying this. If that person repents, then you forgive, and you reconcile and you guys continue moving forward. But if that person doesn't want to repent, then at that point you're supposed to take it up to your spiritual leaders, and then if that, nothing happens, then you take it up to the church. But that's for a different lesson for another time. Right now, we're talking about diverse types of miracles. So let me give you an example, right? If we, if, let's say I operate in the gift of healing, and, um, but not just because you operate in the gift of healing, does that mean that you're able to heal all, every single type of uh, illness? It, your gift could potentially be just to uh, heal cancers, or it could be to heal some other type of disease, and only that, or maybe a, uh, an array of that particular condition, because those are diverse types of miracles, and miracles are, you know, wonder-working power that we have inside of us, given to us by the Holy Ghost. We have the gift giver that dwells inside of us, and the gift giver has the ability to operate any type of gift at any moment that he wants. It all is contingent on our ability to be available and our ability to believe him to operate through us. God wants to use, God can use any member of his body at any moment for any reason to operate and to, delay, to deliver, to save, to heal a person, whether it's in the body or outside of the body, because God heals and he hears the prayers of those who are not saved yet. A lot of the Old Testament uh, miracles that you see, especially with Elijah, he ended up going out and ministering the widow was not part of the Jewish nation. She was a Gentile. And so God has always wanted to include the Gentiles. He's always wanted to include those who are not saved because we all came from not being saved at one time or another. So God wants to do the greatest miracle of all, which is salvation. And so he oftentimes uses signs and wonders and miracles to talk to that person to get them to soften their heart, to get them to be open so they can receive the gospel, so they can repent of their sins, and so then they can be baptized in Jesus' name because he wants to use that to save their soul. God doesn't care that much about healing our bodies or blessing us financially as much as he cares about saving our souls. The ultimate goal, Jesus did not give his life to bless us financially. That's just a byproduct. Jesus did not give his life just so then we could be healed of our sicknesses and diseases. That's just a byproduct. Jesus gave his life so he could save our souls and take them to heaven. And that is the ultimate goal is for us to make it to heaven. And that is the, the reason that, that we propagate and we preach the gospel is to save souls. Not just to heal the sick, but thus, like I said, that's just the confirmation of everyone that believeth went, went about preaching the word and the Lord confirmed their word with signs following. And so oftentimes we don't see the signs and wonders that are available to us because we haven't gone. We need to go. And going is not necessarily going out there and knocking on doors. It's you already have the people in your sphere of influence 
that you that God wants to use to minister to. Those people that look like they will never be saved, those are the very ones that God is dealing with the most. Because the broken road often leads to the road of reconciliation and restoration. So let us not give up on those just because there are a lot of people who are saying, Oh, well, that person is a lost cause. That person is beyond hope. That person is always going to be a drug addict. That person can't do anything right. Guess what? I was one of those. I was one of those, yet God had mercy on me and God reached out to me, and which I'll probably end up sharing my testimony maybe uh, next time. I know I, I owed you one from uh, May 1st, which is my spiritual birthday, but um, uh, I had some dental work done and I just couldn't talk, but uh, I will share that again. I, I think it's a very, very comical, but, uh, but uh, I digress. Um, God wants to operate inside of you. How do you know you don't have the gift of working miracles? You'll never know if you never try out. If you never take the opportunity to stretch forth your hand and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. That's all it takes. I'm not the one. It is not by my hand, nor my holiness, nor my righteousness that this is getting done. But it's only by God's power. That's what the Apostle Peter and the Apostle, I think, Paul said. Said when they said to the man that was there by the by the gate, said, "Look on us. It is not by our righteousness or our holiness. It's by God. It's by the name of Jesus, whom they crucified. It is by Him that we have the authority and the ability and the power, and that you can now rise up and walk. Which is easier to say, be healed of a headache, or to be say, be healed of cancer? They're both the same faith, and it's not my faith. It's." Jesus is faith through his faith, which actually one translation means his faithfulness. It is through his faithfulness, through his graciousness, through grace, by faith, which means through his grace, through his graciousness, through his faithfulness. That's the only reason why we're saved today. Jesus gave his life. He showed great mercy toward me. But just because when he saved me, when I was a sinner and turned me into a saint, over 20 years ago and so that same grace did not stop just because I became a saint not not because I became a minister that stop that grace did not stop but it continues to be that same grace that saved you and me is that same grace that continues to save us and keep us saved so don't beat yourself up just because you messed up repent and get back up just because you fell down doesn't mean you have to stay there there is enough blood at the foot of the cross for us to receive forgiveness, restoration, and reconciliation and to be restored back into spiritual operation. As soon as we ask for forgiveness, God forgets. He forgives and He forgets. So let us not continue to bring back up this thing of this sin that I created that I did 20 years ago 30 years ago, five minutes ago, 10 weeks ago, and then I'm still walking around in circles, like an altar, walking around in the same circle, saying, oh God, forgive me of this thing, forgive me of this thing that I did, forgive me of this thing that I said. And Jesus is like, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. I forgave it the first time you asked me for, I don't know why you keep bringing it back up. You know what that is? That's pride on our side, because we can't believe that God would forgive us because we wouldn't forgive ourselves. You know? So that's pride and we need to repent of that. Because how dare we not forgive what whom God has forgiven? If he has forgiven us, then why are we bringing it back up over and over and over again? That's self-righteousness. Because we cannot believe that we messed up that bad. Guess what? We are all able to do the best thing and also have the ability to do the worst thing. Within our flesh, there dwells no good thing. And it's not based on our ability. It's based on His grace, His mercy that saved us. And that same grace, that same mercy, that same faithfulness is what's going to keep us saved until the end. Because the good work that He started in you, He is faithful 
to complete it, to finish that work. So I invite you today, prepare for tomorrow because tomorrow as everybody starts going to church at your local congregation, there will be a refreshing. The Bible talks about it in Acts that, there, that we should repent for the times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. When he comes and visit us tomorrow at church, when we start to worship and praise, as we prepare our hearts today with repentance, we don't, re we don't, we don't get to church to go to repent. We repent at home, at our prayer closet, in the car, wherever we are, wherever we are. When, as soon as we know that we offended somebody, as soon as we know we had a bad thought, a, uh, a lustful desire, a uh, temptation of any sort, that's when we're supposed to acknowledge that and say, God, forgive me for that evil thought. Forgive me of thinking evil of my brother and sister. Forgive me of saying that evil thing against them. Forgive me for having that uh, lustful desire toward that person. Forgive me for being proud and not wanting to forgive something that somebody did 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five minutes ago. I'm holding the grudge. Being honest is what we need to do. That's what it, we are required to do because God desires honesty on the inward parts. He desires truth on our inward parts. He desires for us to have integrity. We don't have to be exposed if we are willing to judge ourselves. I believe it's in uh, one of the Corinthian letters. It talks about it and says, for if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. For when we are judged, but if we are judged by God in the congregation, when we are judged by God, we are judged so then we won't be condemned with the world. So even in judgment, God shows mercy. He is letting us be saved through the judgment and the way that he judges us because sometimes we are not able to be honest enough to repent of the things that we allow to lurk in the inner chambers of our hearts as if we're as if nobody is able to see it it doesn't matter who sees it or doesn't sees it in the flesh it doesn't matter if the minister is is uh, addressing your your uh, situation or the thing that you're struggling with or your secret sin god sees it and that's the most important part god sees what we're doing god sees what we're thinking god sees what we're meditating in the inner chambers of our hearts and the question is we should as the uh, psalms 139 speaks Search my heart, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. That is the prayer of somebody who is seeking holiness and righteousness. Because holiness starts in the heart. It, it manifests itself outwardly, but it starts in the heart. It starts with being holy and righteous inside the heart. And that comes by being honest. By saying, God, I have this wrong intent. God, I have this wrong attitude. God, forgive me of my pride. God, forgive me of my unbelief. That is an evil heart of unbelief. And that causes you to depart from the living God, is what the Bible says in Hebrews. So we must be careful of what we believe or fail to believe. Because that d directs our steps e either away from God or toward God. Fear is the first thing that comes when we sin. We become afraid to confess our faults. Going back to Genesis with Adam and Eve, as soon as, as, soon as they sinned, they went to hide. And Jesus came by and started trying to walk with them, to commune with them, just like he had done the day before, and the day before, and the day before, and the day before. He came to meet them where they were, and he couldn't find them, and they were hiding. He said, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? So I ask you today, where are you? Are you hiding behind the bushes because you feel ashamed of your sins? Or are you willing to come clean and ask for forgiveness? In Proverbs, it talks about it and it says, if we, confess, if we hide our sins... We will not prosper. We will not succeed. But if we can come clean and we confess our sins, then we will have mercy. And that's what God wants to do today. He wants to restore your faith in His mercy. 
He's not there with the gavel ready to pounce on you for making a mistake. He knows how weak and frail your flesh is. He, excuse me, he knows that your frame is made of dust and how weak your flesh actually is. Yet he made a provision by the sacrificial lamb on the cross. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So when we confess our sins, God restores unto us righteousness because to confess our sins, we must first believe that he will forgive us. And that's faith. And that's the type of faith that Abraham had. He believed God and it was imputed unto him or counted unto him for righteousness. God considered Abraham righteousness righteous because he believed. When we come and we repent is an act of faith because we're coming to the one who says, I will forgive you of all your sins and all your transgressions. He, through his blood, has paid the price to forgive you of every single sin you have ever committed and that you just committed five minutes ago, five seconds ago, and that you're, you will commit in the future. All we need to do for the future ones is the same thing that we did for the, the ones in the past, is confess and forsake our sins. Confess, be honest, and say, God, forgive me, I have a wrong intent, forgive me, I have a wrong attitude, forgive me, I made a wrong action, I said, I did, and he forgives. That's how simple it is. So I, uh, I ask you today, where are you? Wherever you are, let us repent and prepare our hearts for the times of refreshing are coming and we who are preparing our hearts today will experience that refreshing of His Spirit tomorrow. So with that, I leave you today. God bless every single one of you. I look forward to, uh, to ministering there with you and being ministered to by you as our gifts operate one to another and minister to every single one of our needs that the body may be edified and built up in the faith of Jesus Christ. Be blessed and be a blessing today. Let us prepare our hearts with holiness and righteousness and being honest that we may experience that presence of the Holy Ghost tomorrow. Not waiting till the second or third song, but as, as soon as we step into the sanctuary, we are ready to minister because Jesus said, I came not to min be ministered unto, but I came to minister. And that's how the body is edified. We minister one to another. And the body is edified and God is glorified in that. So with that, I leave you today. God bless you guys. I'll see you guys uh, at church tomorrow.